Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, so I, I've been asked to chair this session, and I've got three people here who know much more about science communication than I do. So what I'm going to ask them to do is to give a very brief introduction to themselves, to their career, what they're interested in, and then perhaps give a, a quick minute or two about what's their favourite uh, method of science communication, what have they seen that works really well, but also perhaps a bit to talk a bit about what they think doesn't work well in science communication, what are the problems we've got with the current models of science communication. But after that, what we're really looking to do is not to kind of sit here and talk at you. We want to hear your opinions, have you come back at us, perhaps talk about what you think of the divide between the kind of models of science communication that we're talking about and the ones that you're used to or, or would work in, in different contexts. Um, it, we really want this to be a, a two-way session, uh, partly because this field of science communication is an incredibly broad one, uh, and the, the information you get from the four of us will only be a tiny fraction of what we can talk about. So I'm going to hand over first to Tyler, who will introduce himself and, and kick us off. Good afternoon. I'm Tyler. Um, my interests uh, center on science education. Uh, I, I used to teach high school for a number of years. I also taught Hagwon here in South Korea uh, for three years. Um, I then went and uh, uh, did a PhD in microbiology at MIT, uh, and during that time got very involved in developing online content uh, that both uh, taught scientific concepts as well as just communicated general science, particularly information in the biological sciences, uh, to the general population, to a lay audience. Um, I think that science communication is most effective when delivered uh, in an online interactive format. Obviously, I'm a little bit biased because this is most of what I create. Um, and I think that science communication fails when it's unable to place elements of information into a broader narrative. Earlier today, we heard uh, an, an, an interesting talk, for those of you who are in this room, um, about conversations regarding genetically modified organisms uh, in Denmark. Um, and it was mentioned that some people in the general public didn't know that genes were found in normal plants, and they thought that only genetically modified organisms have genes in them. I think this is a great example of the failing of science education and science communication. Um, and I'm sure that plenty of students could give a memorized definition of a gene but they're unable to understand how that gene fits into the larger context of genetically modified organisms and whether this is something that society should worry about or not. Um, so, yes. Thanks, Tyler. That's, that's really helpful. Next up is uh, Matthew. Would you like to give us your five minutes? Um, my name is Matthew Salter. I'm actually the, the publisher, um, and I used to publish an editor-in-chief of Macmillan Science Communication uh, for the Asia-Pacific region. Macmillan Science Communication is a commercial company. We are part of the Macmillan family of, uh, of, of science publishing and education publishing uh, divisions. Um, and we come under the umbrella of Nature Publishing Group, who published the journal Nature and all of the, the other um, NASA sister journals. Uh, so I'm based in Tokyo, and we've been developing this division for uh, the last five years, uh, starting off in the Asia Pacific region and moving out into Europe and the Middle East. And what we do, and um, so my prime um, activity with science communication is to help institutions that can be uh, places like KAIST, uh, universities, research institutions, even companies, to um, uh, promote the research they're doing, to make it more available to a wider audience. And to, to make any of you who are present at my, my talk yesterday will, will know that one of the things we, we focus most on is helping uh, these institutions explain why their work is, is significant, why, how it affects our lives, uh, and as well as affecting science and advancing science, um, how it's a useful uh, activity and something that is a good use of tax money and, and public resource. Um, and so we want to you know, get the, people, the public excited about science, uh, help them uh, not fear science, so uh, you know, to actually trust scientists and, and see that we're all on the same side and we're all working to make the world, to understand the world and, and, to, and to improve our, our lives and our understanding of, of science and technology. Um, so I agree with everything that Tyler said about um, using online, about making it part of a wider narrative, about making it relevant to people. Those are all absolutely uh, correct. Um, from my job, as it were, my professional activities, um, the, the, the 
the largest, not battle, but the largest um, uh, uh, area that I, I, I think we need to look at and institutions need to look at is, is focusing their message and really thinking about the audience to whom, to which, with, with whom they want to have a dialogue. Um, I see many examples of, of perhaps because of budgets which are rather small, um, institutions trying to um, communicate to a, a, an unfocused audience in a way which doesn't really um, deliver to that audience, and then that really if, affects how effectively they can communicate their science. Thanks, Matthew. Maya, you've already given a, a, a very long talk about science communication earlier today. Do you want to, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I will just sort of, by way of introduction, say that I am a social scientist, um, and but I have been studying uh, since I was a master's student. I've been interested in understanding the relationship between science and society. Uh, so I started out studying why is it that people are so much in disagreement over genetically modified uh, foods or biotechnology used in the healthcare sector. Because I was really curious about how, could, how is it that people, people can be so uh, disagreeing about something that actually is presented as, as a solution. And I found out that, that uh, really what it was about was not just sort of the, technic the technicalities of biotechnology, but it was actually deep founded discussions about what's the role of science in creating a good society in the future. And to lots of people like me and probably I guess most of you, Science is what makes the solutions, but actually there's quite a good, a large group of people in society who thinks that science and technology is what creates the, pro the problems, or at least some problems, or at least what looks good sort of as a solution, actually if we look further, is part of the problem. And I'm very sort of curious about the relationship in general, but, well, between in general people's ideas about what's a good society, and then the role of science in it. And as I said, because we can't take for granted that everyone just shares our idea that the solutions coming from science are just in themselves just good. So, uh, so that's what I've been working with ever since. I've been more and more focusing not just on science communication and public understanding of science, but also on organization of science, the management of science, because I think it, it, it needs to be taken very seriously, these issues, it's something that the leaders of scientific organizations should also deal with. And um, I'm a person who likes to sort of both talk about but also act what I'm saying, so to walk the talk, as they say in America. So um, I've also been engaged in doing um, different types of science communication, trying to tell people about my own research in a, in a dialogical way that invites people to talk back to me and to ask me questions. Um, and if I am to say sort of one thing that I, I the, the best science communication I know is science communication that is a communication. So there's two, both sides do the talking and both sides learn something. They might learn very different things, but they're interested in learning both of them, but also it's science communication that starts with curiosity. I think if we start by the, why is it that's, that this is like this, and then sort of share our curiosity with people outside science, I think that's the best way of, of actually finding mutual interest and in sharing something. What I don't like is when science communication is seen as something that's uh, just supposed to sell science to the people sort of strategically, not actually is about understanding, but it's just about sort of uh, basically marketing science. Uh, and I don't like when then it's marketed like a lot of results. I think science basically is about all the things we don't know. And I think we should be much better at sharing that with people outside science because, yeah, I think we do it wrong if we think science communication is about communicating the facts because I think it's much more about talking about the curiosity the, that drives science. I think that's where we can meet everyone. Thank you. Um, those, those are really interesting points. I wanted to come back on Tyler and, and Matthew for a moment, because I realize both of you have kind of started your careers in you know, the Western scientific and education system, but you've also spent time teaching and working here in, in the East. You know, you've worked in, 
in South Korea and, and, and you worked in Japan. What do you say the biggest kind of cultural differences are and how does that affect how we communicate science? That's a, that's a very good question indeed. Um, I think uh, certainly, you know, working in Japan and Asia Pacific, um, from the perspective of, um, of trying to uh, conduct science communication in, a, in, a, in the widest possible sense, it comes back to something Maya was talking about. It is about curiosity, it's about asking questions and admitting when you don't know things and trying to find those things out. And certainly um, there seems to be in the, the Asia Pacific to a, a larger extent more acceptance of what famous professors happen to say or famous authorities happen to say. And that's, that's, you know, we should respect our uh, people with a lot of knowledge. There's no question that we, we don't, we ignore these people. But um, it is sometimes difficult to get people to perhaps question uh, uh, an, an accepted wisdom about something, um, to perhaps consider that there's an alternative viewpoint uh, that may or may not be right, uh, and accept that, you know, that you can, your opinion you have a valid opinion, you, you may not know as much as your teacher or you may not know as much as a famous professor, but you have a right to have an opinion and a right to be curious about, about that. Uh, and that's um, from the sort of public understanding of science aspect. There are, there are tons of different cultural things in the actual mechanics of doing that, the way you design a campaign, the way you design a website. There's many, many of those, um, and I'd be happy to talk about those if we need to, but I sense the discussion's a bit wider than that. So I think that's, you know, for me, one of the, the things that I've, I've, I've noticed more. Uh, than, uh, than, than is perhaps the case in, in, the, in the West. Would you agree with that, Tyler? I would. Um, I'd also piggyback off Maya's point, um, speaking specifically about my experience here in South Korea. I'd be really interested to see from all of you, with a show of hands, how many of you studied science of some sort in a hagwon? Raise your, raise your hands. And that's, that's, that's most of you, or a good percentage. Um, I'd, be, I'd be loath to criticize certain elements of the, of the South Korean education system. But I'm sure that many of your experiences studying science in Hagwon were a perfect illustration of memorizing lots and lots of information completely out of context. That is certainly what was expected of me as a teacher at a Hagwon, that I would put lots and lots of memorized definitions in my students' brains and that I would show them how to crank through various math problems and physics and chemistry so that they could get the correct answer. But they might not even necessarily understand the thought process behind it. I'm really skeptical of this type of science teaching because just as Maya was talking about, science isn't about the memorized definitions. This is what I like to call the product of science. This is what scientific experiments have discovered. But science is really a process. It's a process of asking and answering questions and understanding what we do and what we don't know and figuring out creative, intellectually rigorous ways to discover new things, to venture into this intellectual unknown. Um, I don't think that the problem of sort of hagwon style memorization-centered science education is unique to South Korea, and I think a lot of it happens in Western countries too. Uh, but I think that the sort of education that does happen in both the public education system here as well as Hogwans is representative of um, is, is, is representative of a, of a type of education that I think society needs to move away from in order to allow citizens to understand what the process of science really entails. That's really interesting. Maya, I'm going to come to the audience in a second to figure out what they think of those perhaps maybe contentious uh, points of view, but bearing in mind what you said about your kind of your favorite and your least favorite type of science communication, you know, the, the first one is where there's curiosity on both sides, and then the worst one is when it's just kind of pouring knowledge into a bucket and it's, it's not very uh, dis discursive. Do you think, um, w would, e would either of what Matthew or Tyler said change your opinion on what the effective models of science communication might be here in South Korea, given there's that difference in culture? Oh, <laughs> I, I feel very um, humble in terms of, because I don't know Asia very well. I mean, so in general, and certainly not South Korea. So I feel very, um, 
I wouldn't like to sort of be an expert on what would work here, but, but talking about it like this makes me think that sometimes we have, because I very much agree with the points that you made, both of you, of course, but, but I think that, um, I, I think I'll just, let's go to the audience and, and I'll come back, because I think it's, I think you're probably more experts of how your education system should be than I could ever be. Can I, can I just pick up something from, from, from there? Um, I, don't, I think, I don't know where it, we get lost along the way um, with, with the interest and fascination in science. I mean, I have, uh, I have two sons. One is four and one is seven years old. Um, they know daddy was a scientist, is a scientist involved in science. I always try to discuss things with them, answer their questions, sometimes very profound, sometimes, you know, very childlike questions, um, and try to get them interested. And they do, they sometimes have to do, a, uh, in, in Japan, in summer holiday, you have to do, there's no real holiday in Japan. You have to kind of work in your holiday and, and carry out homework, even at the age of seven years old. Um, but sometimes, the, it, often there's a kind of a self-study or a self, um, uh, you know, your own free project. And we were discussing what that was going to be about, and I would like to be something scientific that would be good. We couldn't agree on, on, on this. And then just the other day, um, I, you know, I can sense my eldest son getting a bit turned off uh, having to do this. My um, youngest son, he, he found the project, and it was in a horrible way, something he found really interesting. Um, he showed me. <laughs> so then, so then my, here we go. So then my, so he, he found his project, and I was, there was a paper cup sitting on the table when I got up in the morning. I hadn't noticed it the night before, so I thought I would go and throw it in the bin. And, and I said, he said, Daddy, don't touch my cup. So he showed me what it's in it, and it was the, this enormous bug, cicada. You know they're in the trees outside, the ones that make that chirruping noise. I don't know what they're called in Korean. It's, it's, called, a, it's called semi in Japanese. And it was about that big, and he had found his project. He was going to collect dead insects. Uh, for his uh, summer project, but he's fascinated by this. They're ghastly, but there's a, you know you could see at that moment his eyes light up. He was interested, and I just wish we could have that all the way through our lives, um, you know, until we uh, kill up and die. And at some point, we, we have to formalise our understanding and give it a mathematical framework or whatever. But as long as we can keep that bug in a cup kind of uh, enthusiasm uh, in maybe a slightly cleaner and more hygienic way, it would be it would be good. Okay, I'm going to throw it open and look to see hands. Just a quick recap on what we've had so far. We've had the panel saying that the most effective methods of science communication are when there's curiosity on both sides. We've talked about having online mechanisms where there's a bit of interaction. We need to focus on specific audiences, not just have a one-size-fits-all policy. And quite an interesting discussion about whether there is a big difference between Western attitudes and Eastern attitudes to how science needs to be communicated depending on what the cultural context is and perhaps a challenge over what that might mean for the, the South Korean model of, of education and uh, whether science communication itself needs to adapt to fit that all the other way around. Um, who's got questions for our panel or, or points they'd like to make? Okay, we've got two questions there, so one over here. We, have we got any more microphones or do people need to shout? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anderson from Brazil. I'm familiar with the experiments for the students and usually many experiments, the students must follow just the procedure and answer the questions written in the procedure given for them. And what do you think about it? Maybe if we can give more space for them to change the procedure, do things different, they can come up with different questions. I would like to get to know more about your opinion on it. Thank you. And we had one more question over here in the middle. So we'll take this one, then come to the panel, and then come back to some more. Uh, good afternoon to all of you present here. It's really a great pleasure listening to all of your views. But then uh, I'd like to comment a little bit about uh, the way most of our education system works here. Uh, actually, even for students studying their undergraduate program in any kind of university, um, I would say that actually a lot, a lot depends upon, uh, actually a, they, they prefer a lot uh, they actually put a lot of emphasis on the GPA that you get. And I believe that, uh, so students are mostly led into believing that you have to cram up a lot or like you have to study really, really hard 
um, you have to give up on your leisure activities for giving more time for your studies so that you can get a good GPA and you can get a good graduate school. Uh, I don't know how far, how far I'm right in saying this, but as a student, I've uh, felt, felt quite a lot, uh, especially being a student from India and now being in South Korea, I feel there's a very, very similar pattern between these two the education system in these two countries. So, um, moreover, I would like to ask you, do you believe that if you implement um, a more research-led kind of um, institutionalism in, in universities like KAIST, where basically students can uh, focus more on undergraduate research rather than just studying and getting a good GPA, do you think that would make a big change? Okay. And actually, we had one more question just in, in the fifth row here, the lady in the, in the white scarf. Down, down here? Over here. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Rana. I'm from Indonesia and studying in KAIS currently. And I have actually two questions uh, for you. Uh, first is like, what actually the ultimate goal of science communication? Is it to, uh, to make people understand science and what we are doing in, uh, to help society? Or the second one is to make people interested in science. And then the second question is like, uh, I found so many people and so many uh, society that actually they thought that research is something that if they do it for their future, they're not going to have a good future. They're just going to get less money and they're just going to be poor in the future. So many people are interested in going to more like engineering, but after that, they're going for working instead of doing a research. But I've seen that research is kind of a part of really important thing that we do in this world to like make a better life, right? So how, what is actually the method? The method that we make people are interested in going to research instead of working in a companies. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've had three really interesting questions from the audience there. The first one, just to uh, reiterate, was can we make science experiments better in schools? They reflect what science actually is, not just, not just copying things. And the second one was, is there too much of a kind of a focus on the academic merits of science? You know, are we too GPA oriented? rather than focusing on what science is actually about. And the third one, there, there were two questions there. One was, how do we, uh, you know, what's the point of science communication? Secondly, how do we get researchers to actually do research rather than go into other careers? Who would like to take one of those? I, I wouldn't mind uh, taking up the point about um, uh, undergraduate experiments. Maybe that also feeds into the, the quest about GPA. Um, when I was a, an academic, I used to be a lecturer uh, at the University of London, King's College, and also I led a small research group at the University of Tokyo earlier on in my career. Um, and I was very much in favour of trying to broaden out the, um, the curriculum. I'm, so my specialism is organic chemistry. So when you talk about experiments in things like chemistry, one, one does have to be aware that um, we need to design experiments which are safe. So we, we can't have students just have throwing things in, 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 into a pot and then you know, because we, we might get to some in, consequences which, which we didn't intend. That being said, I, I think the idea of uh, what I enjoyed most about when I was an undergraduate was that undergraduate research. So I think what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is we've got, we've got to um, talk about two things here. One is education and, and learning, and one is training, because I think part of certainly um, part of, uh, in the latter half of, a, of an undergraduate degree, there's a, a sense that um, you know, there's an aspect of training in the case of a, a chemist to actually be able to handle things safely, to be able to carry out certain procedures. And that's a training aspect. The education aspect doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing at all. It could be that um, uh, curiosity-driven um, uh, uh, research to actually you know, work to see if you can work a better procedure for, for an experiment, to see if you try this combination, this order of adding reagents, or this particular technique, or look at the data and analyze it in this way, whether you come up with another, another um, uh, way of looking at things. And I think the difficulty there is how do we assess that in the university context? Because it's very easy to assess um, uh, you know, an experiment if you've got a good yield and it was very pure, or you, you know, you've got a very nice straight graph and all your data was nice. It's very easy to say that's that's the right answer, that's the good uh, thing that's, that's accurate and give a mark to that. And it's much more difficult to, to uh, assess or, or, or objectively look at 
you know, how creative or, or, or um, how innovative someone's thinking is. That's a much more difficult thing to, 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 to do. And I think if we move away from being very focused on GPA, then that's particularly an issue in Asia Pacific more than other countries. Um, we have to really start rethinking what we mean by good results, certainly um, at an undergraduate level. Um, and I think it's a, a, a wonderful aspiration. I think it's something we should definitely be moving towards. The question is, how do we do it and what direction do we go in? I think it's a little bit different um, when we're talking about postgraduate degrees, when you're actually, you know, you need to have a rigorous technique to generate um, uh, research results which are going to be of the correct standard to be accepted by, uh, for peer review. That's a whole different thing, and there's, you need a much more, you know, there is certainly a case, therefore, not rote learning, but actually, in the same way that you know, um, a pianist will, will learn certain pieces and will have to go through and, 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 and you know, acquire the knowledge and experience of playing certain concerti, you know, as a scientist you need to be able to develop certain techniques that are going to be accepted in the research community. But that's again a different thing from undergraduate education and school education um, in high schools. So it all starts from there. So um, you know, I think we have, need to think more creatively and I think you know, um, it means going to mean changing the way our universities assess people, the way, what the goals we set for our, for our undergraduate, um, um, particularly in practical education. Um, and it's a big challenge, but it's something we definitely should be moving towards. And Maya, what do you think the goal of science communication is? Is there, is there one single goal? Can we, can we no, talk about No, but actually things? I was going to start even further back and say, what's the goal of science? Because right. I think that the whole point is that we have to start with what's the ultimate the ultimate objective is to solve problems and make a better society. I mean, that's, that's why we have things called science. We don't have science so that scientists can get jobs and get high citation scores and, you know, do rigorous procedures and write in, 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 in the prestigious journals. All those things are important so that we can know that the science that we do is right and correct and works and all. But it's, but that's all, see, it's all, that's, they're not the objectives in itself. And I think if we think about it at that really fundamental level, I think the objective of science communication is the same as the objective of science. It's to make a good society. And in that sense, I don't think doing science, it, that's not a separate activity for all the rest of things. I think it's actually deeply fundamental human to want to explore things, to have curiosity, to find out, to find better ways of doing things. I mean, I'm sure the people who lived in the Stone Age, I mean, they, they were trying to work out how best to survive each day, how best to take care of each other and, you know, get food and, you know, not get killed by animals or other people or so. I think it's the same. Basically, I think this curiosity to how to do things best. And I think, I mean, again, I say this very cautiously because I don't want to say that our, I mean, the Danish educational system has lots of problems. One of them is that the kids don't actually work very much. And there's just been this uh, program on Danish television where they compared a Danish, um, well, class of where they were 16 years old with a Chinese class of 16 year olds and then the fun thing, the Danes, well, it wasn't fun, but what they thought was very interesting was that the Danish kids didn't know half as much as the Chinese kids. Um, but then the Danes would say, but then we're very good at teaching our kids innovation and to be innovative and to do all those things. And maybe that's right, and <laughs> that wasn't even conclusive either. But I think that there is, there is something very good about the Danish model, which is that kids are basically learned they're taught that it's okay to experiment, that it's okay to sort of try out things and fail. So basically, it's not about learning a lot of stuff for the sake of learning it, but you have to learn stuff in order to be able to experiment and figure out exactly. You have to do, do you have to learn rigorous scientific procedure because otherwise we can't know for certain that the result is correct and therefore, and then it won't, I mean, it's not a good, it's not a useful result if it, looks like a good solution, but it's actually not correct. So, of course, therefore, we have to have all these procedures, but we have to get the, the objectives right. I mean, the main point is to find a good solution that works, and then all the other stuff is something that we have to learn. So we go acquire learning these things when we need them. So, yeah. I, I, um, 
And I think that's why I wanted to say that it's not so, not, what goes on in science is not so different from what goes on in the rest of society. So I think if you, that's why I say, if, if, think, if you start with curiosity, you can actually, most people have, do their own citizen science. You know, you meet people, they say, oh, but I couldn't sleep last night, that's because I drank too much coffee. I mean, that's not scientific, but they have a hypothesis and they think about it and they think they've sort of made the experiment. They've made an observation several times if they drink coffee, they can't sleep. So that sense, people sort of go about their daily lives in, in ways that are not so totally different from science. It's just, of course, it's not scientific because it's not as rigorous as it should be. Should be. But by starting with that, then you actually have an, an opportunity of showing how it's it's, um, it's similar. So I think the objective of science communication is the same as the objective of science. But what's happened is that the world is so complex, or at least we found out now, we can't continue having science floating in a bubble by itself. We have to have the whole science, the whole society basically has to become scientific in that way. Thanks, Maya. And we also had a question about careers, and it was focused more on people leaving research to kind of leave science completely, but you're leaving research to start a TV career, as far as <laughs> <laughs> it becomes, I mean, but it's, it's a serious point, you know, how come you're trying to get into become a you know, professional science communicator rather than staying in research and communicating from that vantage point? Yeah, well, I, I think that's an interesting question that can allow me to address a, a few of the other points that were made too. Um, the first is, that there's a very big difference between uh, uh, actually doing science in a research lab and um, uh, with, with no disrespect to any of you because my undergraduate education was, was very similar to yours, um, but there's a big difference between being a scientist in grad school and learning about science. Um, it reminds me of a distinction that you often see in performance fields. You can major in uh, music history or you can actually major in music performance, where you actually learn how to play piano, or you can just listen to a lot of piano music and learn about that. And similarly, there's a distinction between art history, where you look at a lot of paintings and learn how to analyze the text that's art, and then learning actually how to be an artist. And the problem right now, I think, in undergraduate science education, pretty much everywhere in the world, is that everyone is essentially learning science history. You're not learning how to be a scientist the same way somebody who studies art history isn't learning how to be a painter. And so then finally many students who've excelled in the science history classes that they take throughout undergraduate end up in grad school, and I was one of these students, and find out that they don't actually particularly like being a, being a painter, that they like studying the artwork, but they actually don't like being a painter very much. And that happened to me. Um, I, I, I have tremendous respect for the process of science, for doing science in, in lab, uh, and it's something that, that I do enjoy, um, but I'm just much more excited about communicating that process to other people. You don't have to be in grad school studying a very, very specific part of a scientific system in order to be engaging in scientific thinking, and that's just what Maya was saying. Um, so I'm sort of stepping out of this research path because I want to share this process of science with many, many people, many more people than I would probably be able to affect as a researcher, and many people who have only sort of learned science history so far, but don't really understand how, how science works as a way of thinking and a way of learning more about our universe. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Imran, I was wondering if I could just yep. make a pick up a point that Maya made, because mm -hmm. you, you, you basically took the words right out of my mouth in that we all do science, and one uh, you know, example of that is Wherever you go, uh, I, I was on the train actually going to, to, to the airport on, on another trip the other week, and I went by some rice fields um, in, in Japan, and you had rice fields in, 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 in Korea as well, of course. Um, and you, know, you grow rice using that wet paddy system where you, you, know, you put the, the things you plant it, then you fill the, or you fill the, you, you, you create the seed, the seedlings over here, then you flood the, the field and you put the seedlings in, and then they wait for a bit and then you drain it and whatever. I don't, I'm not an expert as you can tell. But I wonder how on earth anybody ever found that out. Because in the UK, you, you go and you plant these seeds in the ground and in the old days they were just gonna do this 
and then it just grows in, in, in the field. And then when it gets to this height, you cut it down. There's none of this fill the thing up with water. It's an amazingly complex process. Um, in, the, in the 14th century, in the 1300s in the UK, somebody worked out that, and it was probably worked out in, separately in other parts of the world, um, that if you continue to uh, plant seeds in the same field year after year after year, eventually the, the soil is, it has all the nutrients taken out of it and it turns to dust. Now, nobody stood there and went, do you know, I think if we do this, then the nutrients will be uptaken by that and it won't be replaced because we're not putting enough home in and, of course, the carbon cycles. They didn't think that. They just noticed somehow, for some reason, that if you did it this way, it was better. And they probably didn't set up a you know, scientific thing. It's, it was, it's people's experiences and the, the, the stimulus they had there was to have food more regularly more and, more and more, uh, have more food security. Uh, and it was uh, passed down by an oral tradition, I would guess, and it grew up in different parts of the world. I'm not, a, his, again, an expert on agricultural history. But we all do science all the time without knowing it. And it's just, you know, we can, we can do that and, and keep that level of interest. And it's really important and engaging because if you don't get it right, you die. So that's really important. But it's also very interesting sometimes when you, you know, you look at growing plants on your windowsill. And, you know, if you put plant in this particular place, it grows better or whatever. It's that science and a lot of what we do in, and publish in journals like Nature is the formalization of procedure and results, which is still important. But if you didn't have the first one, you certainly wouldn't have the second one. Um, and so I think, you know, to answer the question, it is both getting people interested in science and it's getting them to understand science. Um, but you can do science without really understanding what you're doing. Um, it's just these days when you're trying to get a grant to do research, you more or less have to tell people what you're going to discover before you've done the experiments. Otherwise, yeah. they won't give you the money. But that's a whole academic problem. Um, yeah. And that's uh, probably out of the context of this discussion. So we've had an interesting set of distinctions there. I think really focusing on the differences or lack of differences between what science communication is about and what science itself is about. Um, has that prompted any more thoughts or questions from, from you in the audience? Have any, any more hands going up? No? Uh, what, what, what I was going to suggest, actually, at some point, is if each because I, I'm really interested to hear what kind of latent opinions there are. If you want to make your point, but also it'd be good to know if each of you have one, one question for the audience that you'd like them to answer. Yeah, because actually I was going to say that what I've discovered recently is that one thing is science communication. And when I talk about it, it's actually not so much science education. It's more sort of communication to people who are outside the educational system. So every, all the people, uh, everywhere we try to talk about science to someone who's not already kind of institutionalized and have to meet at 8 o'clock in the morning or when you have to be there and sit still and... And so it's so this is like talking to general citizens in general or you know lots of people outside but anyway I was gonna say um, what's come to my attention is that science communication within science is actually getting increasingly important so I work with uh, some synthetic biologists um, and they that group came about by the biotechnologists and the nanotechnologists and they were sort of very very different they had both discovered this new concept that might give them funding, which was synthetic biology. So they both sort of said, we are doing synthetic biology. But then when they looked at it, uh, they could see that sort of, okay, maybe they, the nano had moved about like three centimeters towards in bio and uh, vice versa, but there were still like these two meters between where they were. So, so then they had to sit down and they talked to me about how it took them three months where they had to sit down and talk to each other about what it was that they were doing. And they basically had to go back to sort of high school level, more, or more or less, because their, their disciplines were so different. And, it become, and that's because we have this huge specialization in science. So increasingly, even if you're not going to go and talk to the public, or if you're not going to go and be uh, a teacher, well, if you become a researcher in a university, you probably have to teach. But if you're sort of working in a, in a, in a private company, for instance, as a scientists when you're done with your education, you will have to talk to people who are not of the same discipline as you. And you will need huge skills in terms of being able to, to talk about what it is. And, uh, and there, of course, you won't have to sort of share basic scientific method, this thing about sort of rigorous experiments and observations and no bias and stuff. But you might end up talking to people who have completely different ideas of what makes a scientific experiment, for instance. So then you have to start, to go. so it's just to say that that might not be so, it might actually be quite fundamental differences in what science is 
because between disciplines, we don't agree about this at all. So it's just, we all need to communicate. So I, I usually always think of it as a kind of, a, it's kind of a ladder. And you have to sort of, when you talk to someone who has exactly the same expertise as yourself in exactly the same field, there's a lot of stuff you don't have to say and you can sort of very quickly get on because you don't have to explain very much. The further away people are, like for instance, if you work in a company and you've got to talk to the business side people, my God, then you have to go to sort of far down the ladder. I can say this because I worked in a business school for a long time. So then you have to go down the ladder because they might not know anything about science. So we all need to talk about what it is that we're doing. And do you have a question for the audience? Yes, that was it. Thank you. Because <laughs> that's because I was I was actually thinking whether any of you have had this experience of meeting people from a different discipline, where you sort of have to talk about how you know the, where you suddenly realise the things you took for granted about what science is, where you suddenly realise that this other person who was also a science student but sort of had other ideas, and then you had to start explain. Hmm. Has, has anyone run into that experience during their time here at, at KAIST of both being scientists but not being able to talk to each other or needing to work on, on communication and, and how, did you, how did you solve that? No, everyone's got perfect communication. No, we've got, we've got a response there. <laughs> um, hello, um, my name is Toby Watt. I'm from um, University of Chicago in the US and then uh, I'm an, uh, I am a physics major and interested in um, astrophysics, so I'm doing mostly with a galaxy. So that's one time I talked to um, my friend who are a biologist about a galaxy. And then I'm uh, I always think that everyone knows what galaxy is, and then she asked me what is galaxy. I have no idea how to say Because all I know is galaxy is the place where there's so many stars together, but then that doesn't make any sense to her, so I had to actually come back. And I still learn again what the galaxy means because I already know that um, everyone knows what it means. It actually, um, lima, um, so it helped me actually understand more in the basic level that I try to forget when I go um, higher in the level. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think often that's a common theme about communication that when you try and communicate ideas to other people, it often gives you a better understanding. Of, what, of, the, of the subject itself. Absolutely, and when I, when I graduated my PhD, which was uh, rather more, more years ago than I, I wish, um, I was about to go off to do my postdoc in Japan, and my grandmother, who is, which is 89 now, so she was in, you know, she was in her early 70s, I think, at the time, uh, and she said, you know, I just want to see you before you go off on your postdoc, and she sat down and she said, so dear, she said, what have you been doing for the last three years? Tell me about your research. And it was like, okay. Um, and, I, and she, she made a really good, I think she was genuinely interested, she wanted to really understand, but it was quite tough. And when I was, an, uh, just picking up on my answer, when I was uh, a lecturer, a uh, uh, lecturing undergraduates, the hardest course to teach, my specialism is organic chemistry, is not the fourth year, you know, mechanistics of palladium catalyzed reactions, which is conceptually at quite advanced level. It's explaining to first years. And first years who are coming from other departments, because they don't have vocabulary, they don't, you, you know, as Maya said, you, you have to start explaining stuff. It's, it, it's an example I could give. I watched a TV once, there was a football match on, and they were commentating on the football match. And they basically say, you know, this guy passed it to this guy, he's running into the box. And then he said, I've just been told you've lost your picture, because the picture went out. And he started commentating as if he was on the radio. And he used three times as many words, because you have no picture on the radio. So suddenly he just clicked into, if you were commentating on sport on the radio, and he was describing, it was, he's a pro, and it was fantastic. So then you know, I had to pick a lot more words to use or really carefully pick words I shouldn't use because it's just going to lose people. So I think communication, the ability to actually pitch a, in, in writers that I employ in, in, in our um, uh, department, can you write this story in 1,200 words to a specialist audience? Can you write 400 words to an audience of people educated in science but not specialists? Can you write this for a high school audience? And it's all communication. It's the same topic, but you might pick two. And I would like to know what you, if you had it to explain your undergraduate research or what you're learning now to your grandmother, and this is assuming your grandmother isn't also a professor in the same subject, because there may be people like that. How would you do that? And then one, I'll just finish on saying, at this point, saying, you will really learn about great science communication when you have children. 
because they are amazing and they ask great questions and sometimes and you can't use long words with those guys. So um, but that will be my question to you. How would you explain what you've been doing this semester to someone in your family who's not a scientist? Thanks, Matthew. And, and that really resonates with a lot of that. So I, I did a master's in science communication at Imperial College in London, which is another science and technology specialist university. Uh, and in that course, we were taught that if you can't explain a scientific concept to your grandmother, you're just not doing it right. You have, you have to make it as simple as possible, because that's actually, you know, that in terms of the general population, that's not that far from where most people's understanding of science and technology is. Uh, so it's a really good yardstick to figure out whether you're, whether you're communicating properly. Tyler, I've been, we've told we've got about 10 minutes left. Have you got a, a, a quick point or a question before we go back to the audience? Sure. Mine would be very similar um, to what Matthew just said. Um, I want to leave you with a story. This is a story that I remember from when I was in kindergarten. And I lo wake up! <laughs> wake up! <laughs> I'm awake now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, uh, this is a story from when I was in kindergarten, and I loved planes. I was so excited because I was in kindergarten, and we were going to the airport that day. And our kindergarten class was going to be led around by people who worked at the airport. And I, like my mom was taking a bunch of my friends. I was so excited. And we get there. I still remember. And the guy who's taking our group around is like, uh, over here we have the 100 version of the 747. What's interesting about this is it's a 400 aircraft that's been designed for trans-Pacific flight. Um, the 747-100 differs from the 747-SP, which is designed primarily for Air Iran, which wanted to be able to do a New York to uh, Tehran trip without having to land anywhere else because they hadn't been given European landing rights at that time. And it was like, and he talked like this for like, for like two hours to a bunch of kindergartners, right? And it's like, we were in kindergarten. Like, let us get on the planes and like, like touch them. And, and th this, this I think is just like so representative of so much science communication. It's like talking about planes like that to people who are in kindergarten. That's the analogy that I'd use for so much scientific communication. So I want to I wanna echo exactly what Matthew said. And, and what I have is not a question, but it's a demand. I want each of you to think about that one thing in science or math or technology or engineering that gets you really excited. And don't just think about how you'd explain it to your grandmother or your parent. Call them up and explain it. Do it tonight or do it sometime this week. It doesn't have to be a grandmother, it can be a sister or a brother or just a friend. Explain to somebody who doesn't know anything about that topic that you're passionate about and explain it to them. And if they don't get it the first time, try it again and try it again. And that, that exercise will teach you more about scientific communication than, than anything you could learn in a class. So I hope that you all have a chance to try that out. I know it will be really illuminating. And if you don't do that, Tyler's going to come and shout at you again. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have got time for a few more questions uh, or points to our panel. Has anyone got any, any burning things they want to raise? We've got a hand down here in the fourth row, green shirt. Um. Hi, um, I'm Tony Kim, and I study in KAIST. And uh, I, I just have an answer to the uh, question you uh, so like when I when I was teaching I was tutoring a child and I, I have a problem when uh, the child didn't know the variables so like uh, and I was really uh, hard to explain it and then I, f I figured that I, I, I can explain it by doing some analogies so like let's say if the child doesn't under understand 2x plus 5 equals 9 then I can explain by like what's um, there's like two times of like uh, like uh, like buckets of apples, and then how uh, you add like some more apples, and then you have like nine apples. Then he, he started to understand. So I think that's like I think using analogies to like to uh, like um, easier terms might help under to understand like non um, to help understand non non scientific uh, researchers or kids. I think that's one way to uh, communicate well, and I think. Uh, it's, uh, this is a really important um, aspect that we need to like, communicate with others. 
That, that's a really important point, and I think you know using analogies and metaphors is a really brilliant way to get around having to use scientific jargon. You know, when you're trying to talk about things like genes or DNA or you know types of engines on airplanes, being able to break it down into other types of language is a really useful skill. Um, one of the questions I'm interested in is partly related to what uh, Tyler was talking about in terms of the challenge of going out there and talking to, uh, to other people about your research or, or your work. Do you find it interesting being at a, at a science and technology specialist university? Do you find it hard to kind of figure out what the general state of understanding of science is out there in the rest of society? Um, or do you have opportunities here in, in the university? So for instance, you know, is, there, is there a newspaper which you give to, to other people in, in the city to talk about science? What opportunities do you have and, and what challenges do you face when, you, when you're trying to communicate science? Or any other points or questions as well? <laughs> Got another question over there? Good afternoon again. Uh, basically answering your question, I feel that the main problem which students face here, I, I believe most of the student community here is consisting of the undergraduate population. So what I would, what I would say is that since most of our lives, uh, like four years of our undergraduate education are spent in learning more and more, acquiring or learning about what has been done before, I believe that we, it's really difficult for us to get a chance to go out there and explain what's going on in our minds or what, what kind of uh, aspects uh, we want to deal with in future. So uh, since we always somehow feel that, that oh, we don't, have the, uh, we don't have the credibility to go out there and explain. Maybe we don't have the proper knowledge. We are not equipped with the um, proper information to give out to the people outside. So I believe that's one of the most important problems that we face. And, uh, also, talking about, uh, may I ask a question that she asked, uh, talking, uh, yeah, like, how, how would you try to explain somebody who's not from a science background? So, uh, I had this experience just a month ago when I went to Taiwan for a conference, GIS, it's called Global Initiative Symposium. So, it was composed of students from different backgrounds, mostly uh, business and economics related. So, I was trying to explain them a project related to microbial fuel cells. It basically is a combination of uh, physics and biology and chemistry in some aspects. So I found it really difficult to explain them how, uh, how we could insert plasmids of some bacteria into, into some other microorganisms to produce. Uh, so it's basically genetic, genetically modify, modified organisms. So it was really difficult for me to explain them. So I've been always thinking of how to like how to make it simpler because somehow things which are not visible, like you know, genes are not visible to, to people. So it's really, really difficult for them to correlate. Um, so I believe um, this could be one of the questions I'd be thinking about. Okay, we've only got a few minutes left. So I'm gonna come back to the panel for some final thoughts and answers in a minute. Before I do, last chance for any other questions or comments to our panel. We've got one in the middle there in the striped shirts and one down in the corner there as well. Okay, my name is Alvin, and I'm from Poston National University, who's a major in mechanical engineering. Uh, I got a little bit other different thoughts about, you know, sharing the I idea of my major to who's majoring in other territory. So I major because I'm major in mechanical engineering. One of the our basic basic subject is about the solid mechanics. We are handling the rigid materials and what it happens if the force is on the material. And I wanted, I wanted to explain the term to my mom, who majored in Germany, and she didn't understand totally what I was talking about. What, like the, we have to maintain the equilibrium, equilibrium state of the material. And then I, I changed the word that I used to, like, what if you think of the door which has two hinge? Usually, door just have one hinge in one side. But what about two hinge? And what if what if you think about the desk with the one one arm? I mean, one support in there. Okay, the that I mean, if the one support is on the center of the desk, okay, desk will work improperly. But what if the 
the support was in the edge of the desk, it will collapse at once because the support can, of course, the support can support the force of it, but it cannot support against the moment that it collapsed. So I, I, turn, I just switched the term that I used to use. Then my mom, which, which is, who is, she's like 55, and she understood what I was talking about. So I think it doesn't matter if we change a term that we used to use in our field. Like, you know, because the thing that we're dealing with actually is the so small specific major, majory. But of course, we are, the, but because we are an engineering student and the uh, student who's studying science, the field is about our real life, which means that we just need to use the term that's more familiar to the other people. Thank you, and, and that's another really excellent point that actually often it's, it's the language and the jargon that's the barrier and not the concept. Uh, and just getting around that language barrier can be the important thing. Got one last point in, in the corner here. Is it, it's behind you. <laughs> Hello, I'm Seungmyung Women's University. I'm from Korea and I'm majoring in business administration. And, and I'm really, I really like to learn science as, as a hobby. And, but sometimes... <laughs> just, a, just a minute, I just, very interesting, why are people going, oh? Gregor Mendel, who discovered essentially the, the fundamentals of genetics, was a monk. He did that in his spare time. Um, there's lots of people, I mean, some scientists start off, a lot of people do stuff in their spare time. Um, and so I think, uh, I think it's great yeah, um, to, 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 to do that. I, would, I do business in my spare time, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, like, but, Learning physics or chemistry, uh, it is more than it is more hard than I thought. Uh, getting more deep in the uh, chemistry or physics, like science, I find it very hard to understand, and I I need help. So I ask my friends, uh, who's learning science, and they find it hard to explain to me too, and. Like, like before, uh, uh, like other people, uh, they try to explain using analysis or, or just just skip it or, or like anyway, it is like that. Um, but uh, but after learning like that, I find it some some distor. I find it something was distorted. Okay. And uh, when scientists try to explain uh, non-scientists, they use easy words and skip the hard part to understand. And I think that makes inevitable errors or distortion. Mm. Mm. Uh, so. Uh, is there any way to so solve this problem? That's a really interesting challenge. So we had, we had a few final points then. If you want to perhaps give some summary points or if you have a final bit of advice, that would be really useful. Uh, but just, just to summarize, we had a question about how do we kind of get more platforms for people like we have in the audience today to, to talk about science. Kind of questions about the language from both sides. You know, some people simplifying things to make it easier. And then you know, have the young lady there who finds it actually harder when things become oversimplified. So how do you get around those issues? Sure. To really address, to quickly address your question, I think it's a great point. But I like to think that we need to simplify at every level. This is gonna sound really arrogant, but it's true. In the thing that I study in my field that I do research on, I am the only person in the world who knows the completely correct story. I'm the only person in the world, and so everybody else who thinks they know what I do, they're using some sort of simplification that's wrong. Because I've spent five years studying nothing but this little thing, and I can't spend five years explaining five years of work to them, so I have to simplify to explain it to them. 
And then if a medical school professor is discussing a small piece of my research on bacteria to their class, he or she will talk about only what the medical school students need to know about bacteria, which is a very small portion of everything that's known about bacteria. And so, I al so even though it is tempting to say that simplifications always lead to errors, it's, I think it's much more important to think about how much of the complete picture we actually need to understand. Um, and I would say that if you're just learning science, it's much more important for me that you learn basically what a bacterium is, what a virus is, how chemical elements combine and come apart. And I'm not particularly worried that you can work through the differential equations that describe the eigenvalues and eigenvectors that explain how that chemical bonding is happening. If you get so excited about chemical bonding that you want to understand the physical chemistry that underlies that, that's awesome. But I think it's always important to start somewhere, even if it doesn't give us the full picture. Thanks, Tyler. Matthew? Yeah. Yes, I think it's, I mean, I think it's absolutely terrific uh, that um, uh, we, we can all learn um, things which are outside our field, even if it is in, in our spare time. And that's I mean, a, part of, a big part of science communication is making science understandable, comprehensible, and exciting to people who you know, don't have the luxury, if you like, or haven't chosen to make it their day job or their course of study. So I think there's a, there's a massive industry out there as well, I mean, <laughs> with a lot of very good stuff that's written in many countries. Um, I, I think... Uh, you know, I agree with everything that, 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 that Tyler has, has said. And in fact, if you were doing research, I concluded when I left a research group in Japan, um, the, in, in Japan, the, the, the junior students in the, in the lab have to do all of the dirty stuff, the sweeping the floors and bringing the, disposing the solvents and everything. And they don't get thanked enough. Um, and they don't get appreciated, in my view, enough. But I point out exactly what Tyler said to them. You, you should be really excited because if you discover a new reaction or you identify a new species or you spot a new star, you are the only person in the world that knows that at that point. There was a, a case where I saw someone who's talked about how she spotted, she was the first person ever to spot a volcano exploding on one of the, I think it's Io, one of the moons of, of Saturn. And at that point, you know, you don't keep it all to yourself, but it is so amazing that you know, and it's not being arrogant, it's, you know, you, you know the most in the world about, about that particular example. So I think that's important. Explaining it to children is important. I, we should talk about galaxies because I just recently explained, tried to explain galaxies to my two kids. I have an iPad app that allows you to you know, expand and contract the solar system and, uh, and other galaxies. And trying to explain that, I finally got my seven-year-old to understand uh, basically the galaxies. It's like, the trouble with that is how do you explain billions and billions of stars to someone who doesn't count over 100 yet, <laughs> right? It's true. I realize, and saying, look, there's billions of stars which like, What's a billion, Daddy? Is that a lot? You know, when he thinks a lot of money is five yen. Um, so we sometimes don't even have the numbers for that. But I tried to explain it. It was like, all these, so many stars, you can't count them. And then my four-year-old said, which planet do the Clangers live on? And the Clangers are a made-up uh, kid's cartoon in the UK about, um, about, uh, about mice that live on a planet far away. So he hadn't even got the idea that, uh, that uh, you know, there were, these were real stars and, and, and going around a, a real planet. So I think making it relevant getting the right level of approximation so that you do have the right level of simplification. Um, and making it relevant, one, one last point is, it's about language. I don't know if it's true, but I heard um, that when the Bible was first translated into Chinese many years ago, there's a passage um, where, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And it didn't go over very well because they hadn't got bread in China at that point. So they translated, I am the rice of life. Because that was something that everybody, now, okay, you're changing words of scripture but there's nothing wrong with that because it's making it relevant yep. and I think whether that's an urban legend whether it's actually true sometimes we have to do that we have to change bread into rice so that it really fits so that you're, and in, you know in culturally in terms of an age group in terms of all those things so um, it's thinking about it it's getting the right level of approximation but it's mostly about excitement and I think that's really the most important thing I can take a lot of excitement here at KAIST and I think that's wonderful Maya quick final point yeah and it's about excitement it's about teaching sort of uh, the, the principle. The principle might very often be more important than the actual facts. And if you keep excitement and curiosity, if you keep people interested, then they, they when they need to know the specific fact, they might come back and then you might, you know, just dive into that together to make it less distorted or more sort of, but it's as long as you have the, the interest and you are understanding what's the difference between something that's more true and something that's 
false. Then you, then, I mean, that's where it all starts from, this interest in knowing these things. I want to thank you for sharing your stories with, with us, and I think that that's a really good example in itself, that you're already engaged in science communication. And I think, just like you made a challenge, I would like, in, in Denmark, we, when we have family gatherings, parties, very often there's a seating plan, and then you get to sit next to your old uncle or, you know, someone, and they ask you, what, what is it that you do for a living? And I used to hate that question because it was really hard to explain what it was that I did doing social science and public understanding of science, and, you know, they would always ask me. But now I really like that, you know, and I think when, if you get asked by your mom or your grandmother or, you know, your weird uncle, what is it that you do for a living? Use that as a good uh, opportunity to learn something. It's, it's almost like when you have to do an assignment in, in university. It's an opportunity to actually learn something. And the language that works in one context won't work in a different context. Or the, the analogy that you use with someone won't work with another one. So you also learn something about society while you're doing it. Because you learn something about how is it that you get this, this person or this group of people or you know, this family member or or whoever it is, how is it that you get different people to understand different things? Because that teaches you about how is it that they're different? What is it that they are? What are they concerned about? Or what are their pre-understandings? So it's a really good opportunity. And the last thing I want to say is, I used to think that when I would become a university student, I would know stuff. You know, before I went to university, I thought, when I go to university, I mean, at university, they're clever. They must, so when I'm a student there, I must know. Then I was an undergraduate student, thought, okay, one, once I become a postgraduate student, that's when I'll know. And then I was like, oh, so then, okay, PhD students, they're teaching classes, and they, they must know what it's about. Then I became a PhD, and I learned to do what everyone does, which is to just fake that you know stuff. And then I sort of went on faking, and I'm still waiting for that day when I wake up and think I know stuff. And I'm sort of, it's just, this is the fact of life. We all, we, none of us actually know enough to be talking about in, well, most, okay, Tyler might know something about this. <laughs> but, you know, we just have to learn to live with it. Do your best, that's the best you can do. Thank you, Mike. Well, I think our panel have all done a great job of at least pretending to know what they're talking about. They've given, <laughs> they've given you challenges, they've given you inspiration. Hopefully, we've all learned something from you as well. Can you give me a hand in thanking Maya, Matthew and Tyler?